So this should be pretty interesting. So what I have here is a rather old, this is a, a, a Nikon N70. Um, this is a, a film-based SLR. This came out of the rubbish bin. So this is fairly interesting because this is one of, if not the earliest uh, Nikon cameras that have autofocus. This camera, in particular, this camera here has a, um, here we are. This has a single AF point. So this should be pretty interesting because I want to take this part and kind of, you know, take this as an opportunity to really look into and uh, spend some time discussing how autofocus, in particular phase detection autofocus in these cameras works. Hey, so this is a, a, a prefix to my Nikon SLR teardown. So it turns out uh, in my kind of, actually I'm recording this after I did the entire teardown and it turns out that I had made an incorrect assumption in how some of the face detection autofocus works. Um, I had missed that these two micro lenses had a, a significant function in the face detection autofocus work. So what I had, I had actually been assuming that both of these two separate sections is projected on one coherent linear CCD, in which situation I wasn't entirely certain how it, the system was able to distinguish between, you know, if these are two projecting onto one single CCD and then you know, as the focus sweeps through back focus to front focus, the two points would swipe, you know, basically sweep past each other. You know, and I wasn't sure how the, the system would then know which way to drive the lens. Uh, but it turns out that they're using the fact that, you know, basically as the, the focus changes, the point on these lenses where the, the light rays impinge changes, and that's actually causes them to shift, you know, basically in opposite directions across the two smaller linear CCDs. And then they just do like a centroid. You can see these two little graphs down here. You do a centroid, and then you just compare the two it's position, and then that you know basically, and then when they're both identical, your image is in focus. So I, most of this video will have me making that technical error there. Uh, I you know again, I I do a lot of follow up on these videos. You know when I'm editing it, where I you know basically double check a lot of the stuff I'm talking about to make sure I'm talking about something coherent. And in this situation, I didn't catch it until afterwards, but I don't want to throw away the whole tear down or try and do it again because I've kind of cut a whole bunch of wires. Anyway, so you can kind of see how, you know, as the system focuses, this is a cool little uh, JavaScript applet from Stanford, and there you go. Sorry, this is just kind of another follow-up in the same vein. Um, well, or this isn't really a follow-up so much as it is just a neat explanation, you know, kind of a prefix to seeing the actual teardown of the actual SLR, where you can see here that these are the various light paths taken within an SLR. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, so you have your, you know, basically your main light comes in here. This green line here is your sensor. This red line is the shutter. And then down here you can see you have the main, the primary mirror, which projects an image onto the focusing screen, and the secondary mirror, which projects the image down into the autofocus. Uh, so what actually happens is, because you can see that, the, you know, basically the distance from this point up to the focusing screen is identical from the distance from this point back to the, the sensor, or film, in this case, it's a film SLR, what actually happens is this is a basically what's called a ground glass screen. So what you're looking at through the viewfinder is the image projected on this surface. You know, so basically it's a transparent surface that, it's like a, it's a frosted glass, basically. Um, it's done by grinding the surface of the glass with a very fine abrasive, but it effectively looks like frosted glass. So what happens is you're, you know, when you adjust the diopter, it's actually tuning this lens system, which is basically just a way of looking at this surface here. And then this box here, which obviously has one, two, three, four, five, is the pentaprism because it's called so because it has five sides. But the other thing you can see here is there's another sensor up here, which is the, the auto exposure or the metering sensor, which also you know, uses a slightly different path, but it runs through the pentaprism and that also looks at the focusing screen. One thing that's not mentioned in here that is we'll see in the teardown is that there's a, a, a fourth light path, which is only present when this the camera is actually taking an exposure. So basically this mirror here is flipped up and the shutter is open. So basically all of the light coming in the lens, incidentally this is the aperture, these two red lines. So all of the light coming in the lens is just being projected onto the sensor and there's another, or film, and there's another little light meter down here which looks at the light reflecting off the surface of the sensor. And that's used for the TTL flash metering. Basically um, the camera, uh, you know, when when you're using a flash, what the camera does is it, it opens the shutter, it fires the flash, 
and then it integrates the light reflecting off the sensor because you know assuming you you know what the reflectivity of the sensor or the film is and you do because it's consistent you can by looking at the light reflecting off that measure the amount of light which has fallen onto it so there's a sensor down here which integrates the light reflecting off of that and then once the camera has determined that from the reflected light that enough light has struck the sensor slash film for whatever ISO you're running at say ISO 100 it sends a signal up through the TTL which stands for through the lens incidentally metering uh, flash control system which actually causes the flash to terminate its flash early on and that basically means that you know since most situations or most situations where the flash is you know being run using TTL the flash is the predominant light source so what it can do by terminating the flash because it can quench the, f the, uh, the discharge in the flash much more rapidly than it can f uh, you know basically stop you know close the shutter you know and also additionally because again the shutters are you know they travel vertically they don't it's not an instantaneous thing so closing the shutter would result in you know basically the top section being exposed less than the bottom section as the shutter swept down or vice versa if it went up so by stopping the flash they effectively stop the exposure and you know since the flash is illuminating the entire scene it effectively halts the exposure on the entire scene and that gives them the, the major advantage of that uh, you know you can control your exposure fairly precisely because again the flash stop you know, the flash stops very rapidly and then that's not drawn on here but that's kind of an unusual thing and that's not used everywhere but that's where the TTL metering and that's how the TTL metering works and we will see the various features of that in the teardown as well but what we'll see here and in fact I've this is the second you know not the first time I've taken apart an SLR and I'll probably actually insert and you know comment on some pictures I've taken previously when I did a, a conversion um, so, uh, so this is a, a Nikon Nikon D80 that I have converted to infrared, um, and that conversion process involved uh, completely tearing it apart. I actually took it apart to the point where I could get in to the autofocus sensor and remove the uh, the IR filter from the autofocus sensor as well as from the main sensor. So that way, I also removed it from the metering in order that I can hopefully, um, you know, that this, the, the whole system will work completely on infrared. I don't have an IR only pass filter on the meter or on the autofocus sensor, which basically means it meters on a, a mixture of the two. But theoretically, in a, in a situation where there's only infrared illumination, uh, this camera will still work properly because it has no IR cut filters at all. Um, unfortunately, I don't really use this very much, mostly because the user interface on Nikon cameras is kind of shit. Uh, I'm a Canon guy, and uh, it's not as good. So bite me. <laughs> Start a religious war in the comments. But uh, yeah, so in any event, so I have been, you know, basically I took this apart completely. Uh, actually, let me see if I can. So, you can see that, the, you know, basically that dark color in there is the infrared filter. So, normally you'd see the sensor, but because this has an IR only pass filter on there, it's just a, basically it looks like a dark, uh, it just looks dark because it, it just absorbs any visible light, and it only passes infrared. But, uh, in any event, and then you can actually, well that's also, you know, so you can see down here, uh, you know, so down there, there's a is the where the AF sensor is. It's down in that little hole at the bottom there, and then you can kind of see the secondary mirror, and there's a partially silvered portion there. So this has a number of AF points. I think it has um, one, two, three, four, eight, eleven. So this is an eleven point AF system, whereas the this camera has only got a single. Um, other things of interest, uh, you know, here's the lens. So this is. Uh, Nikon cameras, a lot of the old, or all, all the older cameras, and you know, still some of the bet the higher model newer cameras have uh, focusing motors built into the camera body, which is what this is here. So that engages with this little slot here, which is how the camera focuses the lens. So the lens has no motors built in. Um, other things you can see here that this little tab here opens and closes the aperture. So the, there's no electrical aperture in the lens either. So what happens is this little pole here, when you take a picture, is what... Well, first of all, it looks like it's tied into the the mirror, which is interesting. 
Um, so I guess they use one motor for both, possibly. I'm not actually entirely certain how it works. That'll be fun to look at. But so basically, this Paul, you know, normally it's up, which means that the aperture in the lens is completely open. And then it stops down by, you know, closing it to certain extents. And then there's also the hard aperture set, the hard kind of the override on the lens for older cameras, which is what this is. So normally the camera manages the aperture itself, so you can change this, flick that switch and put it into your whatever you'd like, and that sets the how, you know, where, how stopped down you are. So you have like an override in effect. Um, so there's, again, a similar, the, you can see this little control pawl here, which is right there. Sorry, the interior of these cameras is black to try and reduce spurious reflections, but it makes it damn hard to take pictures. Uh, interestingly enough, this one appears to not move the mirror, so they may have the, the, the assembly slightly different. But anyways, there's the little AF controller, and you can actually see that this, which is the autofocus manual focus switch, retracts that so that it allows the, the lens to move freely. Because otherwise... Uh, which way does this go on? See, so Nikons twist backwards. Yeah, they do. Because um, otherwise... Uh, you know, so normally it moves freely, but if you put it in, you know, autofocus mode, you're back driving the motor in the camera body, which is not really necessarily good for it. So you can see here we have a, a very similar arrangement where you can see it retracts. The other thing that's interesting is that the, the lens release retracts both the, the rotation pin and that, which makes sense because that would effectively hold the lens in place as well. So this... Being an older model camera takes CR123s. Um, unfortunately, I can't really power it up because I don't have any have any CR123s. Um, it's got some old 123s on there, but there's not much interesting. I mean, it's just a ca it's it's just a film camera. So other things of interest, you can see, you know, take up roll. Uh, so with film. You know, basically you have variable ISO depending on your film, and there's actually a series of contacts on the film canister that come in contact with these little pins here, and that actually tells the camera what the ISO rating of the film in the camera is. So it, you know, I'm not too sure, it's probably like a BCD coded or gray coded or something like that, but that's what these pins are for. They're for the lens, the film canister communicating to the, bot, the camera what the ISO of the film in the camera is. Let me get these rings off. Okay, so let's take a look inside. Oh, I guess I should probably mention, I'm probably going to spend most of this making snarky comments at Nikon's expense, just for my own amusement. So if you like Nikon, uh, why? So, I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I originally snag this out of the trash. It smelled really strongly of gasoline for some reason. I have no idea why. I originally snagged it out of the trash, you know, thinking I might want to reverse engineer the, uh, the lens communication protocol. And then I realized it's a Nikon. Why would I want to bother? So at this point, it's just going to be a teardown and let's look at how the AF works. So here is the little, uh, bayonet lock. You can see this is one very involved machining operation. And then this is just a shim. So what happens is, you know, on the camera to make sure that the, because uh, most of the, uh, you know, the lenses are registered to the surface of this bayonet lock. So they need to very carefully position this bayonet lock relative to the rest. And to allow for manufacturing tolerances, they have, you know, a kind of an, a bunch of different shims they can insert in here. So this is the one they used in this particular case. Uh, you know, there's they just have a lot of different sizes is basically what it comes down to. And then they just choose the shim that properly, you know, that manages the proper offset so that the lens to film plane, the, you know, measurement is exactly what they need for the particular camera. Oh, another thing that I should probably point out, assuming I can find it on this camera. Yeah, so right here. So if you see that little logo, the little circle with the line through it. That indicates that the film plane in the camera is right there, which is very useful for situations where you won't need to possibly, you know, rotate the camera around the film plane, which you need to do when you're doing panoramas or other things like that. So anyways, so we can see. Oh, there's another interesting point, which is that you see this ring here, which has this tab. 
that tab engages with the manual aperture control ring on the lens. And that's how I believe the camera knows what the aperture setting is if you don't have it set on automatic. Uh, anyways, so this also, I don't think this was their first autofocus camera because it's got the built-in flash and I'm pretty sure the autofocus first came out on some of the higher-end cameras where, you know, you didn't have a built-in flash because everyone who was could afford it probably had five or six external flashes. Um, I'm not too sure, I don't really know the history of this stuff that well. Um, it's another built-in flash, and it's got a, the release is, uh, is completely mechanical too, which is kind of amazing. I wonder if it has an electronic flash release at all. Appears that there was a screw there, which means I had to take this grip off first. I don't know how to get in there. So most cameras, uh, most I've taken apart. This is, I think, the third SLR I've taken apart to a significant extent. Um, and they all, it's the third SLR in like the fifth, or sixth or seventh digital camera I've taken apart, you know, extensively. And they all tend to have exactly one order of operations for disassembly, and if you don't follow that, uh, you'll break shit. Uh, so normally the first time you ever take anything apart uh, is the when you learn how to take it apart properly. The first one is the one you break, basically. Like I just broke, you can see there was this little tab there, which there's a screw going in that way. Which means I have to take the, um, the palm grip off with somehow. Um, the previous, or the, well, I guess the more recent, the D80 that I've taken apart, the first thing that came off was the bottom plate, which is why I went there, but I guess they've changed things. Not surprising, it is like 10 years. Real issue is just, what do you do when you, you're starting to run out of screws that are, you know, run out of visible screws? This is interesting, it's a little readout that maybe, it's an infrared something. So I'm not sure if that's for like a remote, an infrared remote release, or if it's a, uh, or if it emits infrared or what. I know some of these did metering in infrared because I have a flash that, an infrared flash for somebody's camera, I don't know who made it. So you can see down here we have a, a fairly heavy metal plate and with the tripod mounting screw in it because that has to be very sturdy. So it uses these these flex to flex spring connectors which are basically just gold plated sections on the flex you can see here's one half and there's the other half and then they have just a shaped piece of metal which is this which just squeezes them together really tightly and it looks like oh and here's some little plastic washers as well it's very interesting I, you don't see those very often but those so that's how they're coupling these two pieces of flex circuit board in a way that lets them se make them separately it's gold plated but that's just it's very interesting you can see they have more over here. There was one other thing I tore down which I saw those in, which I don't remember at the moment. <laughs> another thing you might have seen is the front, here's the little front cover fell off. And then um, also of interest is, so this, the little, um, the aperture feedback ring has these little, uh, it's got a little wiper on there which slides on these tines here which look like they form some type of very it appears it's kind of a crude quadrant cutter type thing I'm not entirely certain how that works but there's basically a whole bunch of very fine gratings here I'll have to take a closer look at that in a minute I think it is indeed a quadrant coder it's a mechanical it's an electrical it's an electromechanical quadrant coder rather than being an, an optical thing like most of them are. It's 
so I have to get this side panel off somehow. Because most of these connectors, oh, it's hardwired, assholes. So here are the, these are the connections for the flash. And this is also very common in cameras like this, where they, they've hardwired a lot of the connections. They don't have connectors for wires. And this will just have to get snipped. So these two heavy leads, I can almost guarantee, are the high voltage to the flash, because here's the flash, uh, the uh, can for the flash, the, uh, the photo flash cap. I, mean, I can figure out how to speak. So this board here is going to be the flash electronics. Um, I wonder what this, this, this little mechanism down there is. It looks almost like it's part of this piece of brass here. I wonder if that's like a big ground. Yeah, look. They're all connected together. I think that's just a, a convenient ground. I wonder why they have three ground returns. Well, I guess there's high pulse currents here, so they might have needed three ground returns for the proper EMI rejection or something. For it false five triggering. I have no idea. But I bet these three leads here. So I'm not too sure how this works. They either, if they have the ability to stop the flash, um, but I bet these go up to either a trigger transformer or, and possibly like an IGBT, though I don't think they had IGBT at that time. Other thing you can see here is there's the, um, the the thumb wheel, and you can see that this is again, it's a mechanical quadrature. So you can see they have the two kind of the two phases offset, and then as you rotate it, the two leads make contact at a phase. And then you can also see that the you've got a lot of electronics. Uh, you know, I bet this is involved in driving the, the fairly complicated display. And but then the, down here you can see the flash kind of goes into that hole there because of the the flip feet flash. Uh, oh, also that's interesting. So you see this assembly here. So that all of that complexity there is just a push button. So what you see here. So all of that is just a little push button that's pushed by the flash. That's what happens when the flash is closed. So it just it just jumpers these two pads together with their little tines. Isn't that the most ridiculously overcomplicated push button? So you can see here's this big Japan branded TQFP. So that's almost definitely some sort of Nikon ASIC. M MB89151, Japan. You can also see there's the little, there's the encoder with the little, you can see the kind of the phase offset in the two sections. And there's that interesting connector. You can see the little gold tines which connect. Just a little. This is all probably fairly early surface mount because this is going to be late, you know, early, you know, late 80s, early 90s. I'm not too sure about the dating on here. But uh, also, you can see here, you know, that this complex thing here is the shutter button. So you can see there's the half press actuation and there's the full press. That's the full press, and then the top two are the half press. First, so there's focus, and then take picture. And somewhere under here is the LCD. You can also see here's another one of those, the plastic shims, which fell off. So, moving on to the camera body. So, you can see lots of electronics. Pentaprisms under here, somewhere in here, I think actually right here probably is the metering sensor. Yeah, 
So there's the metering sensor. And then, so, so there's that really finely graduated quadrature assembly, which is how the system reads back the aperture ring position. And it looks like, I'm pretty sure those are connected. Every other trace is connected in parallel. So as the, uh, the little spring detent rides across it, it jumpers to one, to both, to the other, to both, one, to both, to the other, to both, to one, to the other, to both, to the other. To Actually, if you think about how that works, it's not quite quadrature because it would jumper to one, to both, to the other, to both, to one. So it's more like a triature. What's the, the, the permutation of quadrature for only three states? Um, I guess it would still work, though. You could definitely determine which direction it's going with only three potential states. Anyways, oh yeah, there's something interesting, which I guess I should probably point out, which is that if you look down in here, you see those slotted screws? There's one behind this belt here. As an aside, there's a belt! So those three screws, that one and these two screws, are how the autofocus is tuned. Because if you look, you think about the camera, where's my paper? So your camera, you know, so you have, you know, here's your your lens basically kind of, well here's the lens flange and you have your light comes in here so here's your, you know, one of your mirror and then the other half is like that and then here's your AF sensor so your light comes in, bounces off there and goes down to the AF sensor but then when the mirror, the, when the, um, the mirror is up it, you know, basically the light just carries on and strikes the film so what you have to be sure here is that the distance this distance to here and then down has to be exactly the same as the distance from this, the um, the lens mounting plane to the film. So basically this distance has to be exactly the same as this distance, otherwise the focus, you know, basically it'll be in focus on the AF sensor and out of focus on the film or vice versa. So what happens is this sensor can be moved up and down, you know, so basically you have a, a rectangle and you have adjustment screws at three corners. So you can move it, you know, so basically you move all three, once it moves up and down, you adjust these two. So you move all three at once and the sensor moves up and down. You, you optionally adjust these two and the sensor tilts this way. And if you adjust this one, it tilts this way. So by adjusting them, you can get in and out, and both axes of tilt. So what you do is, it, you know, there's a, there's a, you have to tune it so that the two sensors are in plane. And I actually, I had to, when I modified the D80, I had to retune the autofocus sensor, and I did that mostly just kind of by fidgeting with it. I don't have really a, a precise method for doing it, but, you know, basically I started out with a center AF point, and you, you, you focus that until it's, you know, you, you adjust that until it comes into focus, and then you kind of start looking at tilt in one direction. So first you adjust, you focus, you, you set the center, and then where you have the two screws, you tune the tilt in the lower right and the, or the, the upper right and the lower left corner so that your sensor is in plane all along this axis, and then finally you tune the last axis. That was how I did it, and it's probably not necessarily the correct way to do it. It worked. It took about an hour and a half, two hours, and I wasn't hurrying. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was devising it as I went along. So in any event, it's not that hard to recalibrate your AF. Um, I'm sure there's, like, I bet they have some sort of mechanism that, you know, some sort of fancy thing they stick the camera body in and tell them exactly how many turns they need to turn each screw. But I just did it, you know, just by taking a whole shitload of pictures. <laughs> so here we can see, uh, whatever this is, it appears to be a two-leaded component, so it's probably, I don't know, it's either a photodiode or an LED. Um, it might be like an indicator for the self-timer, I don't actually know. But I said I, never, I didn't have this camera actually working. And now it won't go back in. Great, I broke it. Not that I really care, but... That's amusing. Oh. The whole thing kind of slides in there. So, pentaprisms under here. It looks like we have a fair amount of the processing up here as well. So that is a HD 6433388F8 which is just another big TQFP device. Um, you can also see this 
like to wrap flex around everything. I mean, look at all of this, you know, contorted circuit boards. And I can tell you that the internal interior of the D80, exact same thing all wrapped around the top half of the camera. Because um, remember, in this section here and here, there's there has to be a fairly large amount of motors and electronics and crap in here, you know, to, to move your, your, your mirror and to, you know, drive the AF, you know, I bet, I bet that's the AF motor right there. And then there has to be something in there to caulk and recaulk the shutter. And so there's a, there's a huge amount of mechanical crap in here too, which we'll get into. Um, these things normally. So basically I expect this whole mirror box to kind of come out. That's the way they tend to go, it seems. Also, you can see the um, the focusing screen. You can see the the spot metering circle and the little AF. You can also see the mirrors kind of dusty, but you can see the various markings on the focusing screen, which is actually right up there. That's the actual focusing screen. And oftentimes, you can actually it looks like I can. So I think if I go in here, I don't know which way it comes. There it goes. So. So there's the focusing screen, and they do some really weird shit to these to make them behave in optically interesting ways. I don't have any idea how this shit works. Don't ask me how like a, a split prism focusing system works, I have no freaking clue. Anyways, so... I'd like to, I bet there's a connector in here for the metering sensor, but I don't know where it is exactly. So it looks like we're just going to start taking it apart elsewhere. So the first thing first, let's take out, um, let's get big. take off the two strap loops. So here you can see there's lots more kind of aggressive grounding stuff. So these are the strap loops, and one of the things you might notice about these is they're really comparatively rather heavy metal held in with three big screws and an alignment pin to the camera body. So these have to be very sturdy. You can kind of hear that just like this. You can also see they've got, you know, it looks like they're both grounded. I wonder why. I guess if they're trying to worry, they're worrying about environmental ESD. If the strap loops are kind of big metal lumps poking out of the case. But I mean, yeah, these are um, steel, maybe stainless, I don't know. So here's another one of these interesting kind of stacked flex connections. We'll get a better look at this one because my hands aren't going to be in the way as much. So you've got these two big... So you have these two screws which are just kind of short little stubby screws with these enormously wide disc heads. And then we have this kind of dog bone figure eight thing which is just like a mechanical thing. Then we have two little plastic shims. <coughs> Excuse me. We have two little plastic shims, one for each. And I guess this is kind of, correction, that's not plastic. That's like squishy rubber silicone. And then we just have the two flex circuits, which just have these little, you can see they just have gold like pie slices, and the pie slices just get smooshed together, and that's your contact. It's very strange. I haven't seen it anywhere other than in cameras. And it looks like there's some shaped plastic down here to kind of control where the pressure goes. Seems like a really involved way to join two flexes. I guess it's a reconnectable. I mean, you look over here, and they've just got, you know, this flex rigid circuit board here, and they've just got it soldered down to this section of flex here. You can see that's just kind of soldered on. Anyways, so down on the bottom. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, so look there. So here is. Um, part of the transmission for the, uh, the the film, the film canister. So you have your winding motor over here, which I guess this probably also handles the advance 
So you have your take-up roller. I think that's what it's called. I don't know the film terminology that well. It's a little bit before my era. So you have the little roller over here, and then it's all rewound back into the canister when you're done through this. So this is just a little uh, kind of a keyed insert that engages with the film canister. And this is driven through this tooth belt. Looks like the belt's kind of slack, but it, it certainly can transmit plenty of torque without skipping teeth. Anyways, so many little screws. A little tight spring. So you can kind of start to see it looks like. So this mechanism right here, I bet, has something to do with the shutter. Um, there you can see the AF adjustment screws more clearly. I don't know what this big central oh this big central hole is just a relief to allow the uh, the tripod socket to insert to fit and poke down into. Uh, so let's see if I can't figure out how to actuate this shutter. Yep. So so this is part of the caulking mechanism for the shutter. I'm not too sure which way. So there's actually, there's two curtains. So if I go like this, I should be able to very carefully. Oh, maybe not. All right, I'm not too sure. I have to get in here further. But I should be able to open at least one of the, sh the, cut the, sh the shutter curtains. But that does tell me that this motor right here is tied into this, the shutter apparatus. So this is sheet metal, but look how thin it is. I can just kind of smoosh it. I have to be very gentle with it. Let's take out the view part of the viewfinder. So one thing I noticed about this that I thought was kind of interesting, no diopter correction. I guess anyone with glasses just has to suck it up. Under here is going to be the metering sensor. Looks like it is indeed glued on, which doesn't surprise me because the other ones I've taken apart were also at least partially glued together for no particularly coherent reason. Yep, so there is the metering sensor and we will definitely take a closer look at that in a moment. So you can actually see that it uses another partially silvered mirror to look. So basically this, again, actually the one interesting thing is, is that the metering sensor looks at the focusing screen. It doesn't look through the view, you know, the lens in the same way the, uh, the sensor does. The metering sensor uses the, um, uses the focusing screen as an intermediate, which means that if you change the focusing screen, it will often cause the, the metering to no longer work properly, or it'll offset the metering in interesting and novel ways. Um, so that's actually kind of one of the common things, issues people have with aftermarket uh, focusing screens, is that the metering no longer works properly, you have to dial in some EV correction uh, to make it meter properly anymore. around even more. What is the most ridiculously overcomplicated assembly? So here is the camera body. And this is... Is this whole thing metal? Uh, large sections of it are plastic. But this whole... It seems like... That seems to be plastic, but then there's metal in here. 
That's metal. It's a big mixture. It's a melange. So one thing I've interested here is you can actually see that this this particular connection here, there's a top layer. So there's something that sits on top of here, this layer. So this another layer that connects through to here, and then this layer connects through to there. So this is it's actually a four flex sandwich connection type thing. Because apparently just having one connector was too I don't know, made the thing too simple. Oh, I see. Okay, so there's two separate things here. So you can see that this little gear chain up here is driven by the, the these little film sprockets here. So that feeds into what looks like this Hall effect sensor here. Whereas down here, um, I think the motor may actually be in the middle of this reel, which is kind of a clever way of packaging it. Oh, no, wait, this is driven, sorry. So one of these gears is some sort of clutch assembly. Oh, there we are. So look, they have like some funky clutch shenanigans going on here. They do love their excessively complex mechanical things, don't they? Ah. Huh. Oops, correction. So I was just yanking on the motor leads. So I was right, they did. They are in fact using the center of the take-up reel as a place for the motor drive. That's quite clever. So how did those leads get in there? Oh, derp, they just go right down here. So it looks like these are those two leads and I bet that this is like a motor driver chip of some sort. So power comes in here, there's this is this big where so that is a D16805 by NEC. Not the big part. Some inductors. Um, so here is probably that's the transformer for the flash. We've got some interesting package big devices like a TO252 but mounted up on legs. It's an even weirder package. Some uh, polystyrene caps, those are pretty unusual. So this is probably like a resonant oscillator or something for the, uh, the transformer. Not a lot of creepage distance in there for all the voltage this sucker has to deal with. And this is um, 310 mics at 330 volts. So there's just the little flash assembly board. You can see here's a um, funky little axial, or excuse me, radial through hole cap bent over and mounted surface mount. I wonder if that's like a little tiny super cap that has handles battery backing when the uh, the batteries are being changed. Because actually one thing I noticed on the lid here is there's your little RTC crystal. It's quite cute. Anyways. So there's the flash. So, oops. There's the film take up roll. And then here's this uh, really quite involved gearbox thing. It's got a lot of gearing in it. So, and then it's got like a clutch of some sort, and then this is what engages. So, I bet when you drive this one way. Um, so depending on the direction you drive this, it probably engages, you know, it either forwards or reverses the, uh, the film, you know. So they have one motor doing many different things by driving it different directions with clutches. Anyway, so here is the actual uh, mirror box, and we can start to see more of the mechanical oddments. Try and get the freaking pentaprism off. But you can see here's the, uh, you can kind of see these two arms here, which are part of the shutter assembly. Where are my tweezers? So, if I'm fortunate, it's really stuck. Okay, I have to figure out how to actuate the shutter. It's more interesting. This is another funky-ass connector. 
So here you can see that is the AF sensor right there. And then this strip here, I believe, is the interconnect to the AF sensor. And it looks like it's connected through right there. So it looks like this is another one of these funky stacked up interconnects. This one is just like a horizontal row of connections. So we have the dog bone, we have a silicone pressure pad, and then we have just a row of gold contacts on each side. And that's how the connection for the AF sensor works apparently. Shazam! So how's that for a ridiculous piece of flex engineering? This is a it's a flex rigid assembly with one two. It's got one two three four five six seven seven discrete stiffened areas. Man, isn't that just redonkulous? Man, I wonder. I mean, this must have been. To some extent, pre-computer too. Well, no wait. Some of these traces are kind of 90 degrees-ish. I wonder how they did this. This was it done on with a really early piece of CAD and way too much spare time. I mean, Jesus. It's one hell of a piece of engineering right there, especially for the early 90s. I'll probably try and scan these flex assemblies just because they're so cool looking. How would you ever re <laughs> How would this ever be repaired? Where'd it go? There it is. So here is this. Here is the circuit board, and this I'm not too sure how this works because it's it's a single-sided PCB. I'm gonna have to put that under the microscope too. Anyways, we can just start to see all of this really involved. I think down there these two coils are probably related to the shutter release. So that's what's going on. Um, I expect this whole thing to kind of come apart in two halves. So let's try and... I think these hold the pentaprism on. Another thing you can see here is it looks like there's also... Wait, it looks like the pentaprism is carefully shimmed too. Because if you look back... So here was my drawing of this assembly. So remember, the focusing screen is up here. So there's the optical path straight through the film, the optical path to the secondary mirror down into the center, and the optical path that just goes straight up into the, into the focusing screen. So all three of these optical paths have to be exactly equal length, because otherwise one of them is going to be out of focus. I mean, I think they're willing to talk, you know, you know, again, it's just an issue of, you know, one of them is going to be the viewfinder focus, one of them is the autofocus focus, and one of them is the actual film focus. And they all have to match you know, basically exactly. So there's a lot of really fine tuning in these things, which is why SLRs are still expensive. So here's our prism, and you can start to kind of see. So looking in there, you can see how, you know, the viewfinder looks in, and also this right here, let's see, where is it? Right there. So that is the viewfinder, which is also looking at the, excuse me. So this is the viewfinder, and this is the metering sensor, and they're both looking at the focusing screen, which sits. Let's see, where did I put it? Where the hell did the focusing screen go? There it is. So the focusing screen sits right here. 
So both of these two things are looking, they're, you know, basically they're, the optics are shaped so that they, they look at the focusing screen, obviously from slightly different angles, but it's, they effectively have the exact same view. And because if you look in here, you can kind of see here's out there. And then if also, if you look in the, you can kind of see that's the same view. So they, it's two separate views into the same thing done through them, you know, using the pentaprism. So what is, so I think this ribbon that goes in here, I think this is the heads up display in the viewfinder. Yeah, so that's looking into the viewfinder. Because if you look into, you see, you look into that slot and you can see my finger. So I believe, this must be a whole bunch of really tiny LEDs of some sort. Some sort of funky ass glass encapsulated thing, or it could be a bulb, I don't know. Um, it could be, actually, now that I'm looking at it, it might be an LCD with a backlight. I'll have to, I'll put that off for a minute too. So, here's interesting, so, well, oh hey look, I somehow flipped the mirror up. So there's the mirror, and, let's see, how did I... If you look at it at the right angle, so this appears to be the mirror. So whatever lifts the mirror also cocks the shutter. That's interesting. But um, all right. So if I lift the mirror up, you can kind of see that little slightly discolored rectangle there. That's the partially silvered portion that normally reflects through to the. And you can kind of see it right there. That's what normally goes through to the the uh, autofocus sensor. So actually, now that I'm down here, why don't we take the AF sensor out all the way? So if, I don't know if you can make it out, but well, let me get a smaller slot of driver. So you can see these three adjustment screws. Assuming I don't drop the freaking screwdriver. And then lose a screwdriver bit somewhere. But as I adjust this, you can see how it moves slightly. So the way these normally work is they're actually held up on three springs. You can kind of see it tilting angular what, you know, an angle. So they have three springs so that you just tighten the screws and it kind of pushes against the springs. Man, I suck at slotted screwdrivers. All right, so here is the AF sensor, and then here you can see the three tensioning springs, and then down there you can see there's a, a mask that affects kind of that basically kind of limits the area it can view and prevents you know angular light. Hang on a second. All right, All right so let me flip the mirror down. So. If I go like that, you can see light coming in gets reflected out there through the partially silvered portion of the mirror. That's actually interesting. You can also see see through the mirror a little bit at the right angle. Yeah, there we are. So you can kind of see that little hole. So that's just kind of seeing down at an angle and seeing through the partially silvered portion of the mirror. So, all right. So, and then there's the AF sensor. You can see it's got some bizarre optics on it. Get into that in a bit more, in more depth in a minute as well. Looks like that has further mirrors in it. Right now I want to look at the shutter box. And now the, uh, this drive sprocket thing comes out. And these two green leads just vanish down into there somewhere. That's interesting. So look here, you can see there's this little plastic cover. You just push that out, well, or whatever, it's a sticker. And that allows you to stuff a, stuff a screwdriver through there and get access to this screw in here. So, 
Oh, that's interesting. So this has a switch in it of some sort. Um, so it looks like... There was something that actuated... Yeah, so... I guess this sat in here somehow and push that little tab. So this may be another film presence detect of some interesting variety. Because you can see, yeah, I see that just pushes that little tab there. Just another little tiny, ridiculously delicate switch in the film pass somehow. Other than that, okay, so I think that now, at this point, I can say that I've kind of officially entirely dealt with this. This is a very interesting kind of box. It looks like it's actually, um, it's a mixture of metal and plastic. I think they, oh, I wonder how the hell, how the hell this was made. Um, I bet this is magnesium. It kind of feels light and brittle. Um, what is this? So that is just glass reinforced plastic, but this is obviously metal of some sort, and I see no seams. How were they? I think they must have shot the they must have shot the plastic or they they molded the metal. They injection molded the metal, and then they put the metal into the, a mold and shot the plastic over it. Man, what, what a manufacturing process. Yeah, look at that. So you can see there, I just kind of broke off a section of the, the plastic, and it looks like the, it is indeed shot over the metal in a two-step injection molding thing. Because, yeah, you can see there's the metal kind of down in. You can see the metal's down in there. Man, that's ridiculous. If this is magnesium, I may try and set it on fire, but that'll be a separate video. The real challenge is going to be how to get the things apart. All right. Of course, that's the easy way to make stuff like this. Leave no stone unscrewed. Yeah, so you can see here we just have lots of little fine, fancy little tines. More shit held on with sticky tape. Yeah. So these are just electrical spring contacts and they actually connect through the film canister. It looks like there's more. Oh, that's interesting. So I either just got paid or I just got charged. So if you look in here, you can see these two holes here had contacts on them. I wonder if that's like for a factory reset or like an auto, a power winder or something. That sits in there? I don't know. Interesting. Um, the only thing I can think of is... I don't know, that wouldn't make any sense. Was that I was thinking if this was a large enough gear reduction, that could be kind of one slot per picture on like your 24 roll. 24 shot roll of film, but that doesn't make any sense. But that is just weird that they have a big open section with no opto slots. And they've got, you know, like a whole bunch of fine resolution slots and then nothing and a whole bunch of fine resolution slots. I wonder if it's aligned in such a way that they can fine tune it and then this gives them like an index of funkiness. <laughs> So here's the, let's see, There's this is the lens release button and this is the AF manual focus knob, which as you can see here, kind of just tilts this. It tilts that little mechanism there. And it looks like what it also does is these two little gold fingers down there, 
depending on the mode, they make or break connection with this metal section here. So that would explain why all this crap was soldered down. So these two connections here, those two little pins there, are actually what form, you know, they form the switch that detects whether the uh, AF, you're in AF or manual focus mode. What a complex way to do it. Um, They're just like, oh, we have all of these. You know, I guess I guess somebody had a sheet metal bending machine or whatever the hell it takes to make this sort of thing. They're just like, go to town. So these two screws, I believe, hold in the, uh, the lens contact assembly, which is or the communication mechanism assembly, which is that right there. This big communications thing here. This is all shutter interface from the look of it. All right, so this is another opto interrupter, you can see, and there's a bunch of a tooth gear in that hole that sits in the opto interrupter, and that's how it measures this position. Let's see if I can show that. So, all right, it's, not, it's a slotted disc. You can see the slotted disc in the middle there. So that's how it measures kind of the aperture deflection, or the aperture control arm deflection. It's also interesting that that also lifts the mirror. I didn't realize that it did that. Um, Christ, more ridiculous soldered together junk. Man, this must have been like so extensively hand assembled. Is a mystery screw? What will it mystery unscrew? Oh. Alright. So, here you can start to... So this appears to be some sort of bizarro clutch assembly. So there's a solenoid Which does what? Oh, okay, so that appears it locks the position here somehow. Yeah, okay, so it's got a little tooth down there. So how does this work? Because this solenoid seems to me like it would be... It's pushed, it's disengaged, so how does the solenoid engage? But here you can see this kind of geared assembly down there is what, you know, so that interfaces with this through, I believe, this gear here. This appears to have had a very, actually this may, I may have just figured out why this was thrown out because there's a, I don't know if you can make that out. Because this gear has a spring on it, and the end of this spring has come off its little tab, which is supposed to be over here. It's supposed to be like that. And now this, it rewinds. So, I wonder if I knocked that loose, or if that was loose, and that was the problem this thing had. Or it could have just been thrown out because it's ancient and useless. But, you know, that's not fun. So it looks like this can be wound up and then somehow this solenoid engages and then it kind of like breaks loose. I don't know. Weird. But yeah, this is like a little, it's a little coil assembly. I don't even know what it magnets against. It's, it's a coil assembly, but this isn't heavy enough. Let's see, well this was sitting... Let's see, it sits in there. What is it even attra being attracted to? I don't really... Is there like a, a little magnet in here somewhere I'm not seeing? Probably. Man, talk about complex. You can see there's a little ratchet wheel down there. This little steel wheel is what the whole thing works with. Anyways. 
So here we have another little board down in here which looks like it's probably power distribution of some sort. That wasn't held in by any sticky tape. Oh wait, maybe it is. No, it's just held in by pin. So. Okay, so this looks like this is probably the another one of these motor driver. This is another D16805. And then there's so there's these two things which run over to a switch down in here. So this is another switch, and then this is the motor, and then somewhere in here is whatever the mechanism that actually handles. Hmm. There's another big flex in here, another really large complicated flex that I don't know where it's even running. Well, let's take this out, which will just is the, that just loosened up the drive gear. Oh, I know what this is. This is going to be the TTL metering. This is, you know, basically with TTL metering, it looks at, it actually, there's a sensor that reads the reflected light off the sensor for determining when this terminate the flash. So this sensor right here is going to be the TTL metering sensor. I guess this camera has TTL. And I guess this is held on by sticky tape because they continue to hate me. Yeah. Yeah. So this is probably the TTL metering I see with some more little plastic optics on it. And then it looks, yeah, so you can see that if you look at this, you see how it's looking at an angle. It's looking through the shutter. That's probably almost definitely TTL related. One thing I'm kind of curious about is I still haven't figured out how this damned. It looks like it wants to come out this way. How the hell? Oh, it's more shit that's soldered into place. Really? Yep, there's one, two. Held in place with fucking sticky tape. So, yeah. So it's just kind of like a pin assembly from the look of it. Yep. So there is the lens interconnect. So there we are. Now we are completely down to just merely the, the exclusively the mirror box and shutter assembly. And I still have not figured out how to fire the freaking shutter. So. Let's cock the cock. It. And then it looks like there are two. There's two big. Me so looking in here, it looks like a magnet of some sort. But in any event, this is related. What? Something in here has to be. I have to apply current to one of these two solenoids, I would guess. Now, oh. hey! Well, first of all, so anyways, I can open the shutter. So there's a nice example of how these sort of things, what it looks like when they actually move. So there is one of the curtains. Oh, and here's the other. Okay, I'm trying to see how this works. So, I guess the real issue is, how is it caught? Oh, okay, I know what happens. So, what happens here is these two are both spring-loaded. You can see how they pop back. So, I would assume that they're both latched on. So, basically, they're cocked upwards, and then these two electromagnets are energized, which hold them in place. So... Yeah, 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 exactly. So you can see that when the, the mirror drops, it energizes them. 
or it, it lifts them up and then they latch in place through the magnet, you know, basically using those electromagnets. I wonder if I can fire those magnets up. It's a bit messy, but it should work. So we have three little test leads here. And I have my bench supply set to three volts, which is probably, I, I'm guessing these run on six volts, but I'm gonna just start out at three volts because it won't hurt anything. And you know, if it doesn't or need a lower voltage, I'll be fine. So I measured, oh, instant, I measured the resistance of these. Uh, so, and it is 140 something ohms. Oops. 143, 142, and then there should be 260 between the two. Yeah, 181. Close enough. So, three volts. That is basically no, well, 20 milliamps. So we have current. So now, what should happen is. Oh, three volts is enough. So if I release one, it opens, and I release the other, and the second shutter closes. So there you go, that's how the whole system works. What I want to do now, actually, hang on a second. Doesn't take long at all, does it? Oh, I gotta back drive it. There we go, now the mirror's up. Open and close. Well, let's flip it over and look at it from the other side. So, that would also explain why, even you know, with most modern SLRs, so we are open. Mirror closed, shutter is now cocked. So when you that would explain why with a lot of SLRs, the mirror flaps even despite the fact that, you know, even if, if you're taking continual shooting. So the the basically the FPS the SLR can achieve is limited by the rate at which the mirror can cycle because the mirror is required to cycle to recock the shutter. So now I go like that and I open the first curtain, go like that and I open the second. So now oops, and there's a clutch in there which is nice of them. So, that was a single exposure. Let's see. There you go, there's one exposure. <laughs> so, take a picture! Mirror open, mirror closed. Shutter is now cocked. First curtain open, first curtain closed, second curtain closed. So that's quite cool. So there you can kind of see how, you know, basically how this whole thing works. So there's the shutter open and there's the shutter closed. And there's, it appears there's a clutch in there for allowing them to drive it for a period of time, which is nice. So. So it just uses like latching electromagnets, but I wonder. I guess that means that they can't leave the uh, they can't leave the shutter cocked for a very long period of time because it's going to be continually yanking on those batteries. I wonder if they do some sort of clever driving. I bet that maybe the the holding current for the shutters to keep them or to keep them cocked is very low. I think nowadays they use like a bi-stable system with some sort of mechanical latching. Though I'm talking entirely out my ass. Um, but yeah, you can kind of see here's the, uh, you just have these little, see the little metal slug in there, 
and then there's an electromagnet down there and I guess that just kind of sits against there. And then there's just these little switches here which just serve to verify that the shutter, the second curtain has actually moved. But you can just kind of see the, oops, it's easy to push it in from here. Kind of how it folds up all elegantly and stuff. See how the two curtains move completely independently. It's a very complex linkage in there. Look at how soft that thin that sheet metal is too. That's why it's so fast. And you can see how when this cycles, you can see how this cycles the two shutter curtains. So right now they're close enough that the electromagnets can successfully latch and pull them in. And then as they you know, and then basically, so what happens now is the mirror is down, and then when the mirror lifts up, oops, the curtains go the other way. But normally that wouldn't happen. Because normally the mag electromagnets would retain the, sh the curtains in their place. And actually, there's interesting, you can kind of see the little aperture for the autofocus. Well, there's another interesting idea. Can I, um,. So yeah, you can also see down there, you see those three holes? Those are the holes for the uh, TTL metering assembly. So there we go, there's the, uh, the first chapter in what's going to be two of, you know, what's inside an SLR and how it works. <laughs> and as an aside, you think it had enough little tiny parts? You think there are enough little tiny screws? This thing had like a bajillion schmillion parts. They're just like, oh, we need all the parts, all the parts! I heard you like parts, so we put parts in your parts! In your parts, in your parts, in your parts, in your parts, in your parts.